Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our first Sankofa series lecture of the academic year. My name is Gregory St. Dick. I'm the Director of Multicultural Affairs and Social Inclusion, and I will serve as the moderator for today's presentation. But before we begin, I'd like to start this event with an Indigenous land acknowledgement. And so uh, it reads, as members of Lesley University, we acknowledge the Indigenous Massachusetts tribe, the original stewards of the city of Cambridge. However, let us not forget to back our words with action. The acts of uh, excuse me, the acts of restoration, restitution, and collaboration. For without action, this land acknowledgement is just a symbolic gesture with no intent of restoring the Massachusetts people. The term BIPOC was deliberate to include our indigenous neighbors in the fight for racial equality and restorative justice. As we come together to combat anti-blackness, anti-Asian racism sexism, homophobia, transphobia, etc. Let's not forget the ongoing struggles First Nation people face across this country and what we as a Leslie community can do to quell that injustice. And so now uh, I will talk about the Sankofa Lecture Series. So the Sankofa Lecture Series was established to create a forum for thought-provoking diversity and inclusion themed presentations on current hot topics led by guest scholars, authors, and researchers within academia and in society. The meaning of the word Sankofa acts that we embrace our past in order to achieve a rewarding future. The Sankofa Lecture Series creates a platform for diverse perspectives and ideas to be shared and discussed in an, in an open and vibrant community dialogue on critical issues related to race, gender, sexuality, and intersectionality. And in honor of Hispanic Heritage Month, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Ana C. Lopez, assistant professor here at Lesley University. Dr. Ana C. Lopez is originally from uh, Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. She is an assistant professor in the teaching English to speakers of other languages and special education departments at the, at the Graduate School of Education at Lesley University. Dr. Lopez earned her doctorate in special education focusing on multicultural and bilingual education and a minor in family studies at New Mexico State University. Her pedagogies draw from uh, discrete frameworks and Chicana Latina epistemologies that encourage critical thinking, inquiry, curiosity, and collective analysis that challenges interlocking systems of oppression. Dr. Lopez em employs qualitative methodolo methodologies, excuse me, Chicana Latina epistemologies and critical race feminista framework. Her presentation, uh, Testimoniando La Vivado as a means of resistance, a conversation about Chicana Latina ways of knowing, uh, testimonial methodologies are rooted in Latin, uh, Latin American human rights struggles and oral traditions. Specifically, testimonial is the oral process of telling, recording, and bearing witness of lo vivido, or lived experiences, theorizing from the body, and deliberating, naming, and uh, transgressing multiple types of borders, physical, metaphorical, and institutional. Everyone, without further ado, I present to you Dr. Ana C. Lopez. Thank you, Greg. Thank you for that introduction. I appreciate it. Thank you everybody who is joining. Um, I don't think you're seeing my screen, are you? Are you seeing it now? Yep. Okay, great. Hold on, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so uh, welcome to this uh, platica conversation about testimonios and Chicana Latina epistemologies or Chicana Latina ways of knowing. Um, before, before we get started, um, I would like to first thank, um, thank you all for, for, for being here. And it's an honor for me to have the opportunity to speak at the Sankofa Speaker Series uh, in observation of Hispanic and Latinx Heritage Month. Uh, before that, I would like to do a land acknowledgement uh, I live in the state of New Mexico. Um, and as an immigrant, I acknowledge the land I physically occupy as I work remotely for Les Lesley University. 
uh, the land of the Tampachoa, Chihenende, Mezcalero Apache, Lipan Apache, Raramuri, Isleta del Sur, Tortugas Pueblo, Piro, Manso, Tiwa people, the Aztecs of the North, the Navajo Nation, Laguna Pueblo, Acoma Pueblo, Suni and Sandia Pueblo, and Isleta Pueblo. Recognizing that acknowledging the land we occupy is but a step towards justice and, justice and restoration. I'd like to encourage you to learn and support the work of the original and current caretakers of the stolen land that you are in. And also welcome uh, indigenous folks that are joining us in this call. Okay, so let's let's have a little, um, let's talk a little bit about Hispanic and Latinx Heritage Month. And what does it mean? What does it mean to be Hispanic, to be Latinx? And, and problematizing a little bit these two terms. Um, I found this quote uh, by Gonzalez Diaz, who talks a little bit about uh, the role of race in Latin America, uh, where he says, Hay que considerar que la raza ha existido, race has exist existed and exists still in Latin America en los imaginarios culturales de los grupos como idea reguladora de las distinciones y de las relaciones sociales. In the imaginary of culture, the groups as an idea that regulates distinctions uh, and social relations. Um, I think it's critical to uh, think about Latinx and Hispanic, Her Hispanic Heritage Month um, and move away from tokenization and from food, fun and fiesta approaches uh, and think critically about, about the meaning behind, behind these terms and who are these terms often uh, living outside of conversation. If we think about Hispanic, are we thinking about folks that speak Spanish? And who is out of, out of that scope and that umbrella? Um, and so recognizing that also, uh, when, we, when we think about is issues of, of Latinx identities and specifically as connected to the border. Uh, I would like to start this presentation by recognizing and naming the harm inflicted upon people worldwide, such as the military, militarization of the borderlands region in which human rights are dependent on identity, nationality, documented status, race, and access to resources. For instance, the incarceration of people at ICE facilities, the prosecution and blatant violence that border patrol is enacting towards migrants from Haiti, and many, many more. Um, I want to invite everyone here to think about how we understand, how we understand and think about the border and its normalization. Perhaps we normalize violent systems because of privilege or because it might not weigh as heavy on those with a documented status and other privileged identities such as language, whiteness, or proximity to whiteness. So therefore our humanity is not questioned by the system. So I would like to start this presentation also. Uh, for us to think about how do we understand borders? Do we see them as normal? Um, is it a system that affects us and in which ways? Um, it's critical to name all this um, and how both Mexican and US governments are allowing the militarization of border crossing experiences of immigrants and asylum seekers. And I also bring this up because of uh, and critical celebrations of Hispanic Heritage Month uh, can cloud our vision of the oppression and violence that exist in Latin American countries, um, such as Mexico. So today I will be talking about testimonio, how it has been employed as a tool to transgress violence, to denounce systemic oppression, um, and how it has served as a means of disseminating knowledge across multiple borders. Testimonio, uh, it's important to mention that testimonio is not my thing, quote unquote. Uh, it does not belong to a particular person, although there's one guy who tried to tra trademark it uh, and sell it in his professional development, uh, which is very problematic because testimonio belongs to the collective work of women and people who have fought for human rights and liberation. Uh, in Latin America. Um, and Dolores Delgado Bernal describes it as an oral tradition that recounts the lived experiences and how they connect to political urgency. 
So this can look very different for, for everybody, for, for each person who engage in testimony or who produces their testimonio. Uh, some people produce their testimonio as a, a, in a form of a poem, songwriting, writing their stories and collecting their memories as we see here in the, in the books that we have um, on this slide. The first picture, is that, picture that you see is uh, Rigoberta Menchu's book. Um, her testimony recounts her experiences as an indigenous woman in Guatemala, how she experienced and survived political turmoil, grief, uh, aspect of, uh, aspects of her culture and la guerrilla. Then we have uh, Elenia Poniatowska's work, La Noche de Tlatelolco. And this is a book where she documents the experience of survivors and witnesses of Mexico's uh, 1968's ma mass assassination of students, activists, and community members. Um, as a government tactic to terrorize and silence protesters a couple of days before the Olympics began in Mexico City. We also have Cherry Moraga and Gloria Ansaldúa's book, This Bridge Call My Back, which collects uh, many different stories of uh, survivance and resistance that connect to the border uh, by women of color and Chicana Latina feminist writers. This last piece, uh, is one of the most important pieces that inform testimonial work and how it's used in and outside of academia. Uh, it's Telling to Live, and this is a collection of testimonials by, by the Latina feminist group who are four women with diverse backgrounds, class, religion, ethnic, racial, linguistic, sexual, and national backgrounds, and they all work together in this project. Uh, they sat down in many different sessions to talk about their lived experiences of resistance of different systems of oppression in the United States, uh, specifically connecting it to their experiences also in academia as professors. Um, and this work that they, they, that they did paved the way for, for many, many of, of us who are exploring the ways in which we can incorporate testimonial to our research or to our teaching, and I'll get to the pedagogical piece of testimonio in, in a minute. Um, but I want to, to start with this, with this slide because it's really the work of a lot of people that um, value and uplift oral traditions and storytelling. And oral traditions and storytelling are not exclusive of, of Latinx and Hispanic communities. Uh, oral traditions and storytelling can be found across cultures. Um, the problem with that, places as academia have had with testimonio is that it has been questioned uh, because it does not it does not suffice for for the rigid frameworks of academia and the white gaze um, and we'll we'll talk about objectivity uh, in just a minute so this oral process of telling recording and very witness of lo vivido the lived experience is also connected to the body uh, testimonial writers talk a lot, a, a lot about their experiences from the body, the scars, uh, lo que mi cuerpo sabe y siente, what my body feels and knows. Um, it, I, like I said earlier, it has its deep roots in Latin American human rights struggles and oral traditions. Uh, it represents memory. It can be individual, of, of, as we see here with Rigoberta's book. Um, she draws from her memories and her lived experiences and makes also connections to, to, to the body. And as Moraga says, she theorizes from the flesh um, and collective, which is what Elena Poniatowska did with that book where she collected testimonials of survivors of that massacre in Mexico City, in Tlatelolco. Um, testimonial also aims to voice the silences um, and that, in that particular contour or of testimonial, uh, like I said earlier, it, it comes from, from struggle and, and it, it attempts to voice uh, the issues that are being silenced. In the case of Tlatelolco and what happened in, in Mexico City, uh, a lot of the, the information that was being shared about how many people had died how many students, uh, how the government attacked the students, that was not allowed in the media. Um, so there were many tactics of silencing and what, what Elena and other scholars and other activists did through testimonio was voicing those silences and, and naming different forms of oppression, unveiling, it, unveiling oppression and marginalization. Um, it also allows to reveal contradictions uh, because testimonio can be written or read in 
um, in ways that we are thinking about our identity, our privilege. Um, we all, it also invites us to think about how do we refine oppression? How do we refine marginalization? Um, it creates space for solidarity and confianza, which means trust. Um, because uh, working with testimonio and collecting people's testimonio entails that you have a connection with the community, uh, that you are welcomed in the community. It's very different from a lot of work, a lot of the work that happens in fields like in the field of anthropology. Uh, I'm not attacking the field. I'm saying that sometimes uh, and this this types of research can be invasive. Um, it can be violent. And what testimonio looks for, it's for a space of solidarity in which uh, people hear each other, hear each other's story, that there's reciprocity and share, shared vulnerabilities that contest power relationships. So although a testimonio is technically an account made by one person, it can represent the voice of many of whose lives have, have been affected by particular social events like Rigoberta's book. Uh, and this does not mean that every single person in Guatemala went through the same things that she did. Um, it means that her story can be connected to other experiences as well. Uh, narratives lodged in memory are shared out loud and recorded. Uh, like I said earlier, testimonio can be collected and, pro and produced as writing, as songwriting, poetry. And also an interesting thing that I forgot to mention is that um, I'm going to be bringing this up a lot because testimonio has been challenged in different ways by academia and specifically to Rigoberta's book and Rigoberta's work. Um, there is a person, uh, his name is David Stoll. He's an anthropologist who has been doing some work challenging R Rigoberta's story and saying that he has proved that she's lying or that her story is not accurate. Uh, that when she said this, she didn't mean that. Um, he's a white man from the US. Um, and this goes just to show you how these oral traditions are not only undervalued by academia, they are also under very, very um, violent ways of scrutinization. And this, this is only an example. Uh, there's a lot of folks that are working on disser dissertations or academic work that are trying to use this Latina, Chicana Latina epistemologies and ways of knowing and are encountering these barriers of no, that doesn't have validity. No, where's the veracity of that? Because we are accustomed to seeing everything through the white gaze or the, the colonial gaze. Um, and that is how, that is one of the things that I want us to think about. How do we challenge those things? Uh, if, if you are a professor, how do you challenge that? What are the voices that you center in your curriculum? How do you really know when someone is being obje objective? What is your definition and standards of objectivity? So these are, um, this is just one quote from uh, Elena's book, La Noche de Tlatelolco. Uh, the day has come when our silence will be more eloquent than the words that guns silenced yesterday. And that's something that was written after the massacre. Um, and this is something that still weighs very, very heavy uh, and, and still shows up in different forms of violence in Mexico um, towards students the prosecution of water protectors and activists, uh, women, uh, specifically indigenous women asylum seekers from Central America and black and indigenous people of color in Mexico. So here are some of the premises of testimonio. The first one, as I was mentioning, uh, challenging the myth of objectivity. What does being objective mean? Um, and also that uh, the concept of the personal is political and research and teaching are political acts. Knowing ourselves gives uh, meaning to our lives. So what I know about myself and my testimonio has value and is connected to my social, cultural and social political realities. Um, an act of self-naming is a key process for liberation. So again, as I was um, sharing, sharing about uh, Rigoberta's book and how she named her lived experiences in the guerrilla, um, her survival, 
that that process of her taking ownership of her story and communicating it in a way that made sense for her. Uh, that is how testimonial is should be grounded. That that's how it's collected and produced. The person has agency and control over their story and their narrative. There's there's not someone else doing the analysis for them. Um, I know my story. I know what it means. I know what this uh, social political realities and systems of oppressions are doing to me, to my mind, body, spirit. So I can name it in the way that makes sense to me, doing my own analysis. So that's uh, that's that's a core core part of uh, of testimonial. Um, theorizing from the body uh, again. Uh, there's many people that write about this. She, uh, Moraga is one of them, where she talks about the concept of theorizing from the flesh. What has um, racism and xenophobia done to her body, to the body of women of color, of folks of color. Um, how does all this harmful systems, the border, how does it translate in someone's body? And then how does it feel in the mind uh, and the spirit? So that, that that connection of the three mind, body, spirit is central to testimonial methodologies. So here are um, some of the contours of testimonial. It involves critical self-reflection and critical self-awareness. Um, if you are someone who is thinking about the idea of working with testimonial methodology and collecting uh, folks' testimonials, um, it's important to engage in this processes because you need to think about what are your embodiments? What are your identities? Um, what is your connectedness to the community that you want to do research with and work with? Um, and this entails a critical examination of privilege. Uh, what is the community going to get from this work? Um, also, if, if you are someone that is thinking about doing your own testimonial, self-reflection and self-awareness is a process that you're going to be engaging throughout uh, because you're writing yourself. Um, and that requires time, energy, uh, critical thinking, thinking about how your experiences connect to social political realities around you, um, about oppression. What are the systems that, that oppress you? What are the systems that empower you? Um, Papelitos Guardados is another concept that is key to testimonio, and it's one of my favorites because it literally me means uh, those little notes that you sometimes write in a piece of paper when you have a thought or an idea, or if you like to journal and write down your, your, your ideas, your reflexivity, that's a papelito that you put away, or maybe in a notebook that you document um, how you're feeling. Um, the Latina feminist group defines these as protective documents, guarded roles, or secrets that speak to multiple oppressions. But Los Papelitos Guardados evoke the process by which we contemplate thoughts and feelings often in isolation and through difficult times. So the process of Los Papelitos Guardados is something that happens on your own, by yourself, with your own reflexivity. And what the Latina feminist group did, one of the th many things that they did was to get together, communicate with each other, and then share the papelitos guardados with each other, share their, their secrets, not their secrets, but, but the things that had, they had experienced in academia that were, that were so violent and they couldn't mention or talk to uh, with the colleagues that they were sharing space with in that moment. Uh, and how do they theor theorize from those papelitos? So they found that theoretical value um, in, in those little pieces of paper and those memories. Um, one of the main contours of testimonio is the concept of hearing versus listening. Um, so again, when gathering someone's testimonio, it's really, again, connected to confianza, shared vulnerability, but what does listening really mean to a person? Because I can be, you're, you're hearing me, so maybe you're hearing me, maybe you're listening to me as I speak. Um, but how does listening look like? How have I been socialized to listening to a person's story? Um, am I going to be uh, hearing and then interrupting and then jumping in and saying, oh, so one time this happened to me or making it about, about me when in reality it's about sharing and holding space for the person who is uh, sharing their testimonial with you. 
testimonial also has pedagogical value. Um, a lot of wonderful, wonderful scholars, my mentors use um, testimonial pedagogies in their classroom. Um, Dr. Flores Carmona is one of them. Dr. Manal Hamza is another person that really taught me how to use testimonials in the classroom, regardless of what I am teaching in this, in this realm of special education and bilingual education and multicultural education. Uh, how do we then intentionally center the voices from the margins? And what are the pieces that are we that we are integrating into our syllabus and our curriculum? Uh, who are we hearing from? Uh, also healing and, whole, and wholeness, the cohesiveness of the mind, body, spirit uh, as one of the main contours of testimonial is that it should be one of the purposes of testimonial work to communicate a process of healing or to aim for healing by naming the, the things and the systems that are oppressive. I don't know why my slides have those effects. Um, it's, I'm always annoyed by that, but I don't know why Canva is doing that. So I apologize if you, if you are annoyed by the effects. Um, so testimonio es una lengua que desquicia a la academia. It's a language that rattles academia uh, because it's written from the I or the we. Um, academia doesn't like that and journals don't like that. Um, and it's one of the other barriers and challenges. Uh, I, we use, we choose poetic performance narratives to create provocative pieces, to give face to numeric data, increase awareness about power and privilege and present an opportunity for readers to experience and feel the stories that might become not only representation of the events, but the event itself. And this is a quote by Calderon Berumen and Espinosa Dulanto. Um, this does not mean that testimonios cannot have connections with data and with numbers because um, I always say this, qualitative research can be colonizing and marginalizing and quantitative research can be anti-racist. So it's not, it's not a thing of I'm doing, you know, testimonial work, therefore uh, I'm not refining marginalization. No, it's about how we're doing it. And, and what this quote also conveys is that testimonial work takes into consideration the data and the numbers and what's going on. What are the realities, uh, for example, right now with the pandemic, whose lives are being seen as expendable? What is going on at the border uh, in this very, very violent system of criminalization of asylum seekers. Um, so it takes into consideration all of those data and all of those numbers and, and all of the different realities. Uh, but the way in which it is constructed is in a, it can be poetic, it can be a song, it can be art or portraiture of, or a collection of images that tell a story and it has value. Um, so um, during the spring of 2021, uh, my femtor and colleague, Judith Flores Carmona, was invited to facilitate a workshop at the Geotestimonios Transfronterizos series, which was organized by Silvia Rodriguez, Dr. Silvia Rodriguez and Gris Muñoz. Um, and Dr. Flores Carmona invited me to co-facilitate a workshop in which we discussed the meaning, the tenets of testimonio, um, how we have used it, what are the challenges that we identified in using it, what do we do with this testimonials, um, and specifically making connections to the context of the borderland, how the borderland region has changed or how it remains the same in different ways, what are the effects of the ma militarization of the border and our border crossing experiences. So as we were crafting this workshop together, we came, with, we came up with this prompt as a practical way to conclude our workshop, the theoretical part of our workshop and have a little practices with the participants in the workshop, which was approximately 12, if I'm not wrong. Um, I would not share or disclose what, what was shared in that space because of confidentiality. Uh, what I can share is that the prompts that we use uh, with participants to express their experiences was really, really powerful. Um, it elicited a lot of uh, deep and profound thinking about identity, about the border, uh, about lived experiences. 
And the prompts were, were there for us to share with each other, speak our truths to the extent of our comfort and safety and have our vo voices heard uh, and also hold space for each other. It's important to highlight that the aim of this exercise is not to dig for trauma. Uh, and that the participants are to choose which prompt they wanted to work with or if they wanted to participate at all. Um, some of them wrote, but instead of sharing, they listened. Uh, some of them connected to other people's experiences with the border. Um, other issues emerged, such as uh, ex lived experiences connected to motherhood, machismo, gender roles, um, bigotry. Uh, and one of the main challenges that Testimonio has and folks like Alejandro Cervantes in his work, Testimonios and Liberation, Psychology as Practice, are looking closely as how can this practice be trauma-informed? Um, and work like Alejandro's also demonstrates that testimonial methodologies have place in interdisciplinary um, areas such as psychology. So, I'll share a little bit about what I'm doing right now with, with Testimonio. I'm working on a family project that is called Viñetas, Remedios y Recetas, Una Colección de Testimonios Intergeneracionales Transfronterizos. That's a mouthful. Um, but I am collecting the papelitos guardados from women in my family uh, in the form of vignettes uh, or home remedies that speak to healing and recipes that uh, elicit comfort or healing or well-being. Uh, this project explores healing as and the resistance to systems rooted in patriarchy, violence, and heteronormativity, uh, which is something that is also connected to the critical analysis of testimonio. And when we think about Chicana Latina ways of knowing, there's a lot of things that we can challenge. We can challenge the concept of Latinidad. We can challenge heteronormative values that are very, very ingrained in a lot of our families uh, and how, they, how those are violent. It allows us to name patriarchy through our writing. Uh, this project is acknowledging our lived experiences. It's grounded in confianza, in our, the trust that we have, uh, and will be employing uh, platica methodology as Fierro and Delgado Bernal share our family or community platicas conversations allow us to witness shared memories, experiences, stories, ambiguities, and interpretations that impart us with a knowledge connected to personal, familiar, and cultural history. So trying to find the value of those, not only family traditions, but how does the process of healing look like? Um, is there a process of healing? Um, and we are using some of the prompts that I showed you in the previous slide. Uh, to start working on those papelitos guardados. Um, and that is all I have for you tonight. I hope that you that we have some time to chat and some hopefully there are some questions. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lopez, for that presentation. So we will now open it up to questions from the audience. So uh, Anyone who has any questions, just please put it into the, uh, you should see a Q and A um, option underneath. And so I will read out your questions, um, but I actually do have a question. So um, we talked about testimonial being attacked by mainstream academia. Do you see a comparison between testimonial and the recent attacks on critical race theory? Absolutely, yes. 100% um, because of all the things that testimonial names, uh, because it can be uncomfortable. It can be uncomfortable if you are in a position of power and I don't know, in a university, for example, and a faculty member is writing a testimonial, writing their lived experience in that university that you that you have power over that person, of course it's going to, of course it's going to be uncomfortable, and of course it's going to um, make the person or the people in power resistance to, or to because it pushes us to think critically. Um, and I do, I do see a lot of parallels between those two. I do have another question actually. Um, so 
earlier you was talking about how testimonial um, is associated with like healing. So what is your thoughts in regards to like anthropology? I remember earlier you said something about uh, along the lines of like harm. Um, can you like, you know, like expound more on that, like the healing versus the harm between testimonial and anthropology? Yes. Um, so I think that, and also as a recent graduate of college, a lot of the times we encounter this classroom spaces or this rhetoric around research in which we are told you are an outsider, you need to remain objective, you need to remain partial, you're not part of it, you know, like a fly on the wall, you're just looking, don't, don't disrupt, of course you're disrupting an environment when you're doing um, research. And I think that a lot of the times those understandings place us already in, in a higher position of power in which we are looking at people as subjects that we are studying. Um, and it can be harmful because who controls the narrative? What are we doing with the stories that we collect? Uh, it can also be serving of, I'm losing the term. Um, It'll come to me, <laughs> but but it, it can serve to white saviorism. That's that's the, that's the term that I was looking for, white saviorism of. Um, I'm exploring. This is how this community group behaves, and what is what is the value in that, as opposed to the person really sharing their story and taking agency, um, and the person who is sharing their story knowing how they have healed or how they haven't healed. So who, who is then to interpret someone's story? And this is something similar to what happened with, with Rigoberta's work and what, what this person was um, keeps trying to, to push and to question the veracity of what she has shared, which I think it's violent. David Stoll, correct? Yeah. Okay. And we do have a, a question in the chat. So it says, you mentioned the white gaze. How would you define the white gaze? And if I may, can I also add, you also talked about the colonial gaze. Is it um, identical to the white gaze? Just to add on to that question. So the, I think it would be fair to say that the white gaze emerges from the colonial and coloniality. Um, again, I keep going back to universities because it's, you know, it's the environment where I work and I've been, I've been, a graduate student and then faculty and and seeing what are the frameworks that are seen as valuable in universities. Um, the white gaze is that framework which favors certain types of research, certain types of, types of knowledge, certain types of narratives, Western European types of knowledges and ways of knowing. Um, we see it, um, in, in, in education, in English departments. It's not my area, but, but there's a lot of literature, right? What, what are we having our students read? And through which framework are we selecting those materials? And, and what are the intentional connections that we're making between the materials and their identities? Are, are their readings and resources speaking to them? So I think that the white gaze is sometimes uh, and I'm not saying that because I'm a Latina or that I'm Mexicana, I don't see things through the white gaze because it happens and it can happen. It's something that we need to unlearn because of our identities being a product of colonization. And, and, and so, for example, too, in my work, in, in my courses, what are, what, are the, what are the voices that I'm centering and uplifting? And if someone tells me, I'm, you're leaving me out, you know, that can happen because there's a lot of work that needs to be done to unlearn those, those frameworks that are so rigid and so rooted in colonialism. Do we, oh, okay, hold on, we have uh, another question. So Anna, do you see an overlap with youth particip uh, participatory action research and or could you talk about testimonial research with youth? Uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. This is from Erica Dawes. Yes, thank you, Erica. Um, I think there, there can be uh, overlap. I think that 
I think that testimonio can be done throughout context. And like I was sharing before, it can be interdisciplinary uh, because, of, because of what it centers on, which is lived experience. Um, and also in, in this youth participatory action research, what are the systems that, that are being denounced? What are the systems of oppression that exist? So I think a lot of the times uh, people ask, well, what's the difference between storytelling and testimonio? And that's what Dol the Dolores Delgado Bernal says. When, when we're talking about testimonio, uh, we are intentionally naming systems of oppression, which, which are and do have connection with youth participatory action research. And I think that some folks have done testimonial work projects that are in alignment with this, with this topic. Out of curiosity, um, are there like uh, testimonials regarding like the um, like agriculture or the decline in agriculture in Mexico, uh, especially after like, you know, um, when the United States, Mexico and Canada went into their agricultural agreements and then it like kind of like decimated, <clears throat> excuse me, it decimated the, the Mexican economy, right? Where um, I haven't read the study in a long time, but I remember it was like, uh, when it started in like 1994, 1995 to today, like uh, the like the corn industry in Mexico declined by like 70 percent, right? And so um, when you know a number one like <clears throat> resource, right, that a country has and they no longer can provide, right? And all of these farmers, like, what do they do, right? So everyone's trying to, you know, come to you know America, the land of milk and hun honey opportunity, and also I like to thank you also uh, when you was talking about uh, the Haitian uh, migrants at the at the border, right? Um, as a Haitian American, uh, I appreciate that. But and it's similar to Haiti, right, where people aren't trying to come to America for no reason, right? There's obviously an economic need, right, a dire need to provide for themselves and their loved ones, right? So, are there testimonials that actually talk about, um, you know, how policies, right, agricultural policies are affecting, you know, um, like farmers and workers in Mexico? Yes, uh, the work of Ruth, um, I'll type it in the chat, Ruth Trinidad Galvan. Um, she, uh, she has, uh, by she rest in peace and power. She, she did a lot of work uh, with, with Chicana Latina epistemologies, and one of her one of her books uh, centers the stories of women who remained in in Mexico um, when when their partners were um, crossing the border to work in in the fields in the U.S. Um, I am not I'm not familiar with all the literacy and testimonial or the, all the literature that is there in testimonial, but I am sure that that we can definitely find some, some testimonial pieces that connect to the lived experiences, not only of border crossing, but of how that experience has affected um, family, uh, families, uh, the separation of the families, how, how that experience has weighed on farm workers who are exposed to horrible work conditions and exploitation. Uh, I'm sure that they exist. Uh, Th those types of counter narratives and storytelling. I'll, I'll definitely look it up. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we, it's not necessarily a question, but we do have a comment. It reads, uh, the issue of white gaze on students subjective experiences for writing assignments are what I've been experiencing. This is a serious issue that needs to be addressed at the university level. Um, would you uh, care to even uh, I know you, you spoke about I'm that. I'm reading it. Uh, sorry. The issues of white gaze on student subjective experiences for writing assignments are what I've been experiencing. Uh, would you care to elaborate a little bit more on that uh, to the person who wrote this? I don't know their name because it says anonymous attendee. Uh, we'll just give them a, uh, Yeah, let's give them some follow up. Yeah. Any other thoughts, um, questions?
well, while we're actually waiting. Um, so my, uh, my colleague, Kay Martinez, will be hosting the community debrief tomorrow at 1 p.m. I'll actually put the link in the chat to register. And so this is to actually have an open conversation about, um, you know, Anna Lopez's work and, you know, uh, testimonio and things of that nature. So definitely I encourage everyone to uh, join the conversation tomorrow and hold on, let me just put it in chat real quick. Uh, yep, there you go. All right. And you have a, thank you, Anna, by- uh, Thanks, um, Marianne. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, oh, no, that's not the, I thought somebody followed up, but not yet. Yeah. Oh, okay, so it said, yeah. it was, hi, it's so complicated and I'm not able to share openly. Yes. Out to you and uh, via email. Definitely, yes, please do that. Um, I'll, I'll put my email in the chat. It's alopez20. So, yeah. Any uh, any other questions? If if not, I'll just wrap it up. Um, okay. No. Okay. So, thank you, Dr. Lopez. This was really informative for me. And so, uh, on behalf of the Multicultural Affairs and Social Inclusion Office. Thank you, and thank you for everyone who actually attended. Uh, tomorrow, again, on October 1st at 1 p.m., Kay Martinez, the director of EDIJ uh, Learning and Development, will lead the community debrief for members of uh, Leslie community to discuss about the Lopez's subject matter. Um, and yeah, so hopefully everyone could attend. Again, it's at one o'clock, so it'll be from one to two, and this was great. Thank you so much, uh, Anna, and I hope everyone has a nice day, um, and hopefully I'll see everyone tomorrow. Thank you, everybody.